for those that are members and have received this, this is the Blue Ribbon Commission report that we're going to be talking about today, Adaptive Governance, Board Oversight of Disruptive Risks. As we know, risks are critical for board oversight and is the other side of strategy. So with that, I'd like to introduce our program chair to the stage, Anna Catalano. Anna? Music now. This is exciting. I am thrilled to have the opportunity to introduce our program and panelists today. As you know, every year NACD chooses a topic of great interest to provide perspective and tools for directors to use as we navigate the increasingly complex environment of board governance and strategic oversight. This year's topic, Board Oversight of Disruptive Risk, is one that for many boards is front and center in our strategic discussions. As you leave today, you'll have a chance to pick up a hard copy of the Blue Ribbon Commission report on your way out. Um, members of NACD also have access to the digital version available on the website. To help us digest the topic today, we have an esteemed panel made up of three leaders who represent both CEO and director perspective on the topic. Our moderator is Sue Cole, one of the co-chairs of this year's Blue Ribbon Commission Report. Sue's Managing Director at Sage Leadership and Strategy, LLC. She's Director of Martin Marietta Materials Incorporated, Biscuitville Incorporated, and Diversified Trust Company. She's Founding Director and Past President of the NACD Carolinas Chapter, and serves on a number of nonprofit boards, including the United Way and Greater Greensboro and Greensboro Science Center. She's also a member of the National Board of NACD. A little tidbit about Sue, which we always like to add, is that she recently took a biking trip to Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, and in addition to riding bikes, she rode an elephant. There you go. Bill Easter is not a stranger to many in this audience as he's a member of the Texas Tri-Cities Board of Directors. Bill is the retired chairman, president, and CEO of DCP Midstream and currently serves as director of Concho Resources, Delta Airlines, Grupo Aero Mexico, and the Memorial Hermann Healthcare Systems. Bill also served as a member of the 2018 Blue Ribbon Commission. Um, Bill's little tidbit, also a global tidbit, is that Bill and his family lived in Stockholm for six years. Last but not least, since 2008, Kevin Fogarty has been president and CEO of Creton Corporation, on whose board I have the privilege to serve. Kevin's executive career included 13 years at Invista and prior to that with Coke Industries. In addition to providing us with a CEO perspective on the topic today, he also holds the perspective of a board director as a member of the board of directors of PH Gladfelter Company. And the little bit of trivia about Kevin is that he is from Canada, spent many years playing hockey, which I'm sure he finds in Houston, one of those real followed sports here in Houston, Texas. Let me remind you that on your tables there are um, pieces of, there are cards that you can write questions on that come to mind during the panel discussion. Please feel free to fill them out, hold them up, and we will have runners pick them up from you and bring them to our moderator who will try and incorporate them into the conversation. With that, I'd like to turn it over to our panelists um, and invite them to the stage. Thank you. Good morning. Let's take care of some business. I like that song, that's what they played when my daughter was playing basketball in high school. So it has fond memories. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that one of, that I'm very privileged to chair the chapters committee at NACD. And I want, to, I want everyone here to know that without question, this chapter is the gold standard for NACD. So congratulations for that. And your willingness to help other chapters. You, we've got two leaders here today and they're here to learn. So thank you for being that gold standard and that model. 
So let's take care of some business by talking about the BRC for this year. Um, and it's on disruptive risk and the need for us as directors to engage in adaptive governance. We live in a Volca world. Volca meaning volatility, uncertainty, change, ambiguity. As directors, we're charged with oversight of management performance, corporate strategy, and risk management. So thinking about this Volca world, we at NACD thought it was very appropriate to um, have the topic of risk management as the BRC topic. And we chose that not to talk about the known risk that you probably cover in, I hope you cover, in your enterprise risk management processes, but to talk about what's around the corner what are the unknown risks? And someone this morning, um, when I was um, early on, someone said, I'm really excited about the program because it seems like we're going to talk about what we need to know about the unknowns. And that's exactly what we want to do. We gathered 28 experienced directors representing 86 boards. These were public boards, private boards, and nonprofit boards. And I want to emphasize that this work applies to all types of boards, not just public boards. And we also had an expert um, from risk management, had several experts from risk management. We had someone who had worked at Homeland Security. So this BRC is meant to help you, to help boards improve their oversight of complex, fast moving risk that could pose a major threat or a major opportunity. And let's not forget that risk can provide major opportunities for us and for our organizations. So let's start out by talking about what disruptive risks are. First, they're significant. Second, they're severe. And third, they often have a sudden impact on companies' revenues, profitability, competitive positioning, and or reputation. Disruptive risk may be company specific or they may be industry specific. They may be local, they may be national, they may be regional, or they may be global. So what boards need to do is to improve the visibility of direct disruptive risk by enhancing the content and format of reports that they receive from management and outside sources. Boards need to stay informed about company and industry developments between board meetings. And boards need to conduct deep dives with management on disruptive risk and their implications. This, we believe, will give you a leg up on navigating this very volatile business environment. Let me go over just a few of the recommendations that you will see in the BRC. We, the board, CEO and management should develop an understanding of disruptive risk and consider them in context of company specifics. The NOMGOV committee should consider how to incorporate disruptive risk into the board's oversight responsibilities and, and at the committee level and modify committee charters accordingly. We need to ensure ERM processes are effective. That's the foundation. You really can't talk about disruptive risk unless you've done a good job with the foundation of, um, at an ERM. And realize that the ERM process may not detect disruptive risk. We need to evaluate culture, the open, especially the openness to sharing concerns, potential problems, and yes, bad news. We must agree that board diversity is a strategic imperative, and we must go through ongoing education and continuous learning as a priority at every board. Board level risk reports must be forward looking. Sometimes we get too caught up in the past, we've got to spend more time on the future. And we need to make sure there's enough time on the board agenda to discuss adapt, um, disruptive risk and how we can adapt to that. I encourage you to spend some time, especially in section three of the report, 
which has just tons of questions that you'll want to ask of your boards and of your management, and has very practical advice. And speaking of practical, let's hear from our panelists now with, with some very practical words. So, in an NACD online poll of public and private company directors earlier this year, over half of the directors said their board's <coughs> tendency is to focus on um, known risk, the oversight of known risk. Um, and those are the risks that management has already identified. This presents a significant obstacle to the board's ability to understand and oversee disruptive atypical risk. So Kevin, let's start with you um, as a CEO. Why are potential risks so difficult to talk about in the boardroom? And what do you think is getting in the way of this discussion? Well, so I think we're going to start with one of the toughest issues facing this, this whole subject matter. And first of all, good morning, everybody. It's so nice to be here. Um, I once had one of my operational professionals, when I asked him a question uh, pertaining to a measurable risk in our plants, he said, Kevin, let me be very clear. In God we trust and everything else we measure. And I thought <laughs> uh, that kind of sums up how so many of us as professionals in whatever career we're in tend to look at things much more from a perspective of what we can measure and what we can therefore characterize and quantify very easily. When you start dealing with subject matters, uh, disruptive risks being uh, perhaps a little bit more esoteric, perhaps a little bit more uh, in the category of, of uh, coming up with ideas, if you will, of what might happen, the unknown unknowns, if you will, I think it's harder for people to get their arms around it and, and think about that in a productive dialogue in an otherwise you know, constrained board agenda. Uh, I don't think there's a fear of di discussing the topic. I don't think anybody's resisting discussing the topic, but I think it's just, it's hard to get your arms around something that has that kind of unknown character towards it. Kevin, any comment from the board? You well, I on? certainly agree with that, and good morning, everyone. Uh, you know, I worry a lot about um, time on board agendas or even management agendas, if you think about where the knowledge of these risks and the responses really lie. Uh, but then there's a question of whether the discussions are open enough to allow people to surface those. I think there's a tendency for all of us to want to know the answer to the question as opposed to just dealing with the question and, and collectively as a group discussing it. So, I mean, I, I guess I would make one comment about these this series of Blue Ribbon Commission reports. There's a, there's a line that tends to connect these things, so we can talk about uh, disruptive risks for this session, but there was one last year around culture, there was another one around the board as strategic asset. So you have to think about the environment in which you are running and as directors helping oversee these companies. And are the elements right? Is the culture right to enable people to talk about it? Do you build your agenda in such a way that you allow time for interaction? And sometimes these things are better discussed um, away from the board table, whether it's around dinner or whether it's around uh, a glass of wine. And, and the only thing I might add at the end, Sue, is I, I think boards should always resist the notion that it's not going to happen to us. Um, even in those examples where one of these disruptive risks may have affected a competitor or another uh, participant in the, in, in the industry you serve, um, use that as a catalyst for the discussion on your own board. Uh, don't resist that and assume it's not going to happen here. And uh, I can give you some examples which we might talk about in the next few minutes where uh, I think that uh, that character totally applies. So if you think about the culture, you've got to have an open environment where you can talk about these things. We all agree on that. But who's in charge of it? Who, who should lead the discussion um, about disruptive risk? Is it the board at large? Is it the CEO? Is it a specific committee? You want to comment on that, Bill? Yes. Um, it, culture is an important element to this, and I think about it in two parts, uh, intention and process. So, you know, if I think about the process, I mean, 
What's the board agenda like? It should be robust. I mean, first of all, it should be tied to the strategic and performance issues relative to the business. I mean, those are two of our the three or four key responsibilities as directors. Uh, so if you're, if you're on point talking about the things that are really significant to the business, you set yourself up well. Um, you know, so clearly you're talking about the performance drivers, risks, the barriers, and really when you start thinking about risk, how do we mitigate that? Can we mitigate it? Sometimes we just have to be aware of them. Other times we can literally do something to protect ourselves. Uh, the board meetings, uh, again, coming back to are they robust, uh, the conversation needs to be open. And uh, I mean, I'd love to hear from you all at some point about how open you think your meetings are. I mean, there is a full array of, uh, of, uh, of, of board culture, if you will. Uh, you know, in some cases, the CEO is very dominating and the board members are uh, compliant. In other cases, you have a, a very respectful and active uh, dialogue. I was in a board meeting uh, uh, earlier this week, and uh, uh, the CEO uh, put something forward that uh, he was going to express. Uh, one of the directors was expressing concern about that, but over the course of the meeting, we went around and there were different views, and we ultimately came down on one that was uh, pretty satisfactory to everyone. So. You have to be willing to express it and, and talk about it. Um, I think another thing that's really uh, important to me is whether or not you have access to uh, more people than just the CEO as a director, whether you have access to more people than just the CEO or the C-suite. Uh, you know, this gets back to the culture word, but what are things like in the organization? You know, uh, is staff, is the front line respected? Is there an opportunity for people to, to come forward and express things? You know, if you think about risk, uh, how do they come into the organization? I love to talk to what I call gatekeepers. You know, these are the salespeople, these are the government affairs people, these are the people that are facing outside. And they are the ones that often pick up things. And uh, so uh, can they percolate up? And if all the answers come from the top, all the knowledge is there, think about how many things are missed. I've, I've found uh, that whether at Craton's board or uh, in serving as the lead director of, of uh, Gladfelder, that the board does its best work often when uh, management's put forth a kind of straw man on a concept. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and that's not to say that we're looking for affirmation of our straw man as a management team, uh, because it could be just the opposite, that the board says we disagree. Uh, but either way, presenting that straw man, so for management to do a little bit of work going into that board discussion, I think it allows the board to do its best work. And, and I would agree with that. And one of the things that I believe is a major trait needed by all directors is curiosity. And if you as a board member can simply ask the questions, it can add significant value. In fact, Kevin and I talked last week on the phone and we, we talked about several things. Bill was not able to make that particular phone call. And Kevin responded, I guess it was yesterday, said, you know, some of those questions made me start thinking about some of these things a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got a great culture in your boardroom where questions are welcomed and maybe they can't be answered at that moment, but management can think about them, then you're doing your job as a director to put the questions on the table. So I, I encourage you to do that. Now let's go back to this concept of disruptive risk. Um, I think in many situations, the ERM process belongs um, to the audit committee. How many of you have your audit committees doing the ERM? And then reviewed by the full board and certainly exposed to the for, full board. So who should be responsible for disruptive risk? Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd start. I mean, look, I think everyone is responsible. Um, you, you, you know, this issue of the audit committee being responsible for ERM is a little bit dangerous. Uh, mm -hmm. I look at the audit committee as being the process owner for ERM. Somebody that's got to make sure there's a process in place that management as well as board committees uh, follows over the course of the year. 
But you have to take those risks ultimately to the board and talk about the most significant ones. And a hot button for me is to make sure that the organization itself is thinking in uh, ERM or risk mitigation ways. If you think about a company, I mean, there's so many risks that you face. Some of them are at the front line. Only a few of them actually bubble up to the top. So we'd really like to see the organization engaged, thinking about risk in parallel with the opportunities or the basic business that we're running. Then if you, if you, if you come up the organization, those risks and the oversight of them have to be spread around. Something, some of them may be compensated, compensation related. Some of them may be financially related. Uh, I'm on a couple of airline boards, obviously safety and terrorism are critical issues that we monitor. So we actually have a safety and security committee. So each of those committees is, is talking about the risks as part and partial of their, of their conversations. And then when we come to the full board, we're obviously talking about the overall program, the key risks for the year, but we're automatically reporting on those risks uh, uh, during each meeting as the uh, committee leads uh, share their reports. The only thing I would add from what Bill said, ultimately the board must have oversight over enterprise risk management as well as disruptive risk. That's clear. They, they got a fairly loaded agenda. Uh, their meetings tend to be long and often. Um, the audit committee tends to deal in things that are kind of real, immediate, tangible in the quarter, in the year. Uh, governance committees perhaps have a little bit more ability in their agenda to take the necessary time to do a really good job, I think, uh, under, under uh, undermining, if you will, this whole idea of disruptive risk. Um, so I would say start there. Uh, and kind of what Bill, I think, said, I think there's also an element of who are the members of the committee? Uh, you know the personalities of the board. Who's going to embrace this subject matter? Uh, perhaps it's not common between two different companies at one committee or the other is the answer. It's really dependent upon the type of individuals that make up those committees. I so. think that's an excellent point, Kevin. I think that's one of the theme lines in NACD's research that this work has to be company specific. There can just not be a prescriptive way to do everything, but you've got to look at what's going on in your company. But I do agree that it's the gov governance committee that perhaps has the best access to see the full going ons of the board and figuring out where different pieces might fit the best to bring it back together to a board level. And there's just not enough time on a board agenda to give this discussion um, perhaps all is needed all that is needed at the board level. So doing a deep dive in a committee, do, I think does make a lot of sense. So, so one more comment, if I could. You know, we've, we've, we've talked about ERM, and we might talk about how that matches up with these uh, disruptive uh, risks, you know, which tend to be harder to anticipate, harder to score. I, I think ERM is a, is, is a great platform from which to <laughs> handle your, your known risk, but also set up the conversations for those things that may be incoming. I mean, you know, if you think about the levels of conversation you can have, you can go to a board meeting and just talk about the kind of black and white, more perfunctory things, I shouldn't call them that, but you know, the performance of the business and what's going on. Now the next step up is to think about the risks surrounding that, and you might do that through sensitivity discussions, uh, scenario mm -hmm. planning, that kind of thing. So, you know, these uh, VUCA risks tend to be, again, a bit more esoteric. But, but if you don't have a strong foundation where you're automatically thinking about the, the, the normal risks, how do you ever have time to sort of push away from the table? Uh, you know, practically, uh, one of the important things in board meetings is uh, I like to see great pre-reads and everyone, of course, doing their homework. So when you actually get to the board table, you're not draining those slides. You know, you, you have time then to talk about the questions and then move to the implications. And then start asking, well, what could go wrong with this? And I think that's how, how so many things are missed. You know, someone may have a glimmer of an idea or concern, but there's no time, there's not sort of the freedom to, to raise these issues. And it might result in management having to go back and think about something. Uh, that they hadn't before, but that's fine. You know, it's all about 
coming together as a group to, uh, to, to perform well as a company. I mentioned questions a few minutes ago. Let me read four questions that I think are important for directors to ask. Is the information we receive as directors in the boardroom sufficient? Are we using our board's agenda time as effectively as possible? Are we doing enough to look forward? How skilled are we at making sense of the re weak signals that come our way? So I'd like for um, Bill, you and Kevin to to talk about the type of information, you mentioned some of the information, but talk about the type of information that can be provided to the board to help inform us on disruptive risk. And I think a really important part of that is how do you talk about bad news? We all want the good stuff that's going on, but how do we talk about the bad news? Sure, I'll start. Um, I think the second part of that question is important as a backdrop. Um, I think uh, we all know that bad news uh, is part of business. Uh, no business is perfect. And um, I don't think a board can really embrace enterprise risk in the firm uh, and of course then disruptive risk as the next iteration of that uh, if they don't have a good sense of trust that they understand what's going well and what the problem areas are in the company. So. Uh, you know, the old adage that bad news doesn't get better with time here mm -hmm. applies. Mm -hmm. um, so if, uh, if we have some issues facing the board, um, you know, I'm going to communicate that very quickly with the board, even if that means out of the typical board sequence. Uh, because what I've also found is that, that communicating that news actually puts that perspective the board can bring, uh, allows you to feel, certainly as an executive on the team, that um, you're at least mitigating whatever that downside is. So then you apply it to enterprise risk, and I think with that backdrop and the trust that's created between management and the board that you can have a very good discussion around what the potential implications of those disruptive risks are. So what kind of information does a board have to have? Well, I think they have to have a certain backdrop of how the company works. Um, it's not just a question of, what products we produce, but where do they end up ultimately, as an example? We're an industrial company, so our products are used. While we sell B2B, we all are very aware our products end up downstream in many different marketplaces that could have long-term implications uh, if we don't do that right from the standpoint of reputational risk, quality, um, and our ability, obviously, to grow ultimately. So I have a fun, good foundation for that. And then um, use examples of where disruptive risk has occurred that could apply to your company to kind of make it more real for directors. Um, I, we might talk in a few minutes about something that's affected our company. Uh, of course, you're all familiar with Hurricane Michael that just happened uh, three weeks ago in the Florida Panhandle. Well, um, if I were the board of one of my competitors, you know, I might be asking, what if that had happened to us? You know, Craton is dealing with it today, but I would presume that the board of one of my competitors on their next agenda ought to be asking, well, we were the ones that were lucky here. What, what might we have done differently had it been us? And use that as a great example to kind of promote the disruptive rift conversation in the boardroom. Don't ignore it. Don't assume we got lucky. Uh, too bad for our competitor, but maybe we'll make a little money out of it in the process. That's not good enough. Uh, it could have happened to them. Yeah, in terms of the information that uh, directors should have, I think it really begins with, let's, let's say, first of all, the director's um, uh, approach. I mean, I think it's important that you be curious and obviously that you approach the job as an owner, which we truly are, plus we're the representatives of all the other shareholders. So I, I start with things as, as basic as the, the onboarding process as you, as you join a board. I mean, I personally want to understand how the company works. I want to understand the culture. I mean, there's a long list of things that you're able to begin to discern through the onboarding process. And then you really have to live the business to some degree. I mean, if you understand the fundamentals of it, uh, 
Uh, you're you're going to, as a director, then look at analyst reports. Uh, there's a news feed that um, uh, one of my board provides on a daily basis to the directors as well as the managers. And then sometimes you only need to look at the news. If you happen to be a company that's involved in the retail business, there's lots of feedback through social media, uh, through the actions of your uh, competitors. Again, I'm on an airline board and uh, you know, we, we, uh, we move 80 million people a year. So there's all kinds of things that are going to happen to us and our competitors that you should you learn for. Uh, one of the other things we've done on, on, on uh, really all of the boards now is you have a regular meeting cycle four or five times a year, but uh, we've begun having uh, interim calls because sometimes you wind up with a two or maybe even a three month period. And that's a, that's a long time to not know what's going on. So uh, they may be voluntary. Uh, the goal is to not make it too much of an imposition for management. But again, it's part of the stream of staying connected and understanding. Uh, certainly, I encourage people to go to industry conferences or to uh, director conferences. Uh, we have to continually sharpen our saw, but always with the notion of what's important to the companies I represent. And the use of outsiders to help inform, mm -hmm. I think, is something that's really important. To bring people in to speak at perhaps the dinner um, the night before the board meeting. Um, as an example, at Martin Marietta Materials, weather is, and climate is becoming a more important factor in our business. So I think one of the things that we're going to have to look at is global warming and the changes that are occurring in the, in the climate and in the local markets. And if you think about it, um, we as directors are in the business of creating long-term value for our shareholders. So one of the things that you want to do with disruptive risk is look beyond, look into the future at what um, may happen. And we'll talk about a few examples in just a minute. Um, let me say we welcome your questions. This left hand here is holding out for <laughs> your questions that we will be happy to incorporate into our comments. So please bring them on. Um, let's take care of business. Um, Three Volca type disruptive risks that may be important to our companies. I know one is reputational risk, another is risk associated with climate change, which I just mentioned, and then regulatory risk. Let's start talking about, by talking about reputational risk and the role of social media. And Bill, maybe that would be a good question for you since you're on the board of airlines and we've yes. seen lots of stories in social media about airlines. Well, you know, it seems as if everything is known these days, right? I mean, it's only a matter of time, sometimes microseconds. So, um, you know, I think depending upon the profile of the business, you may have to put more emphasis in this. Um, you know, in the case of Delta, uh, we actually have a 24 seven uh, center that monitors social media. Uh, we respond constantly to the input from media, I mean, from, uh, from social media. And, and it goes along with the whole notion of our business becoming much more digital over time. Direct contact with customers, retail oriented business. And I think it's both offensive and defensive. In many cases, you're responding to something that's gone wrong. Maybe it's a false accusation. Maybe it's deserve it, but you have to be able to respond to it. Uh, and, and I think we've seen these things spiral out of control. I promised I wouldn't uh, use uh, too many examples, but I mean, I think we can, we can all remember situations where companies have taken a brand hit and that's translated into a serious impact on their, their market cap a serious impact on customer goodwill. So uh, maybe I'll stop there, but this is, a, this is a, a topic we could spend a lot of time talking about. And so let me ask, how do you get your information about what's going on in social media as a director? Well, again, in this particular case, we have a daily news feed. And uh, so we're actually assessing the trends, how many of them are positive, how many are negatives, what's been the hot news, we get to see some of the responses, or at least the tone of the responses that our organization is sending. 
our, our social media um, tracking area, uh, of course, designs what goes out, but it's tied in in that regard to marketing as well as corporate communication. So we have a unified approach to how we're doing this. Uh, so again, we're the beneficiaries of that. You read the news, but we have a, a daily feed that not only talks about us, I might add, but talks about our competitors. So, so we have the opportunity to see daily um, what's happening. Again, Creton being industrial business to business, um, we, our vision is, like many companies, to create exceptional value for our three stakeholder groups. That's our customers, our employees, and of course our shareholders. Um, when I think about reputational risks, and most importantly here in the context of this discussion, how a board receives, how our board receives information to understand how we're doing, um, I think it's very important that the board has, gets some independent views other than just what I think is going on as the CEO, as an example. So for example, when it comes to uh, our employees, we do uh, biannual engagement surveys with our employees. And uh, these are pretty humbling in mm -hmm. surveys uh, for management teams to hear. Uh, but I think it's important the board hears that perspective, not just of what the employees overall are saying, and feeling about the future of the company they're part of, but also, of course, what are we doing to work on it? Because ultimately, uh, from an employee perspective, you know, hiring, retaining, developing employees, key employees over time can be a function of reputation. Um, when it comes to our customers, here again, same thing, uh, but in this particular case, I think it's very important the board has a sense for what customers are saying about what we believe we're doing right and wrong in our company. And you can use surveys, we do. Um, I personally have uh, direct relationships with some of our, probably most of our top 10 customers uh, I spend time with at least once a year and provide that feedback back to the board. Here again for the board to understand what the customers perceive of us reputationally. And then lastly, when it comes to the shareholders, well ultimately of course they're speaking with their feet in terms of the stock price itself but, but this is where um, it's very important to get an independent view as well. And we use typical shareholder engagement or uh, uh, assessment surveys, share those results with the board, do so over time so you can see whether or not you're making progress or not. Uh, and most of the data that you get back in these types of surveys is, is, is very much, it's not real, uh, it's not analytical in the sense of being able to measure, but it certainly gives you enough anecdotal evidence to understand the perception of the company in the eyes of these key stakeholder groups. You know, Sue, I would add one more thing. If, if, you, if you think about what Kevin has just said and what I said, it's important for us as directors to satisfy ourselves that management has a robust process for dealing with its issues. I mean, social media is one of the, uh, the, uh, the newer uh, things. And, as we talked last night at a, at, a, at a dinner of the group, we, we got into a conversation. We had one millennial with us, but we got into a conversation about how many of us are on social media, Facebook, et cetera. And, and it wasn't really related to age because uh, uh, you know, there was one non-millennial that's very active on, on, on social media. But, but where does the company stand? Because again, it's, it's, it's one of these incomings that can be very unpredictable and, and sometimes quite detrimental. Uh, and further, it's management that really runs the company. So I'm not so much interested in understanding everything that's happening, but I take great comfort in knowing that we have a process by which it is going to be handled and then those things that are really <coughs> serious bubble up to whoever on the board needs to be involved. So reputation is something we as directors have to be really on top of because a lot of things can go wrong and can impact our revenues and our profitability. Let's talk about climate change. Um, Kevin, you mentioned Michael, and I don't think it was in your imagination that a storm like that would hit Panama City. Yeah, if I think about that week, on Sunday there was a tropical depression in the Gulf Coast. By Wednesday it was a Category 4 that was headed right towards our plant. We have a plant in Panama City. We actually have a plant in Pensacola and Panama City, so we weren't sure, but we knew that uh, the, the cone of uncertainty was pointing our direction. Uh, as it turned out, our Pensacola plant was spared, but our Panama City plant, uh, 
literally was on the west eye wall. It was a direct hit. Um, and this all happened in a matter of three or four days. I'm not sure if this quite categor uh, is categorized as a black swan event, but it sure feels it. Um, and, uh, you know, there, of course, today we're dealing with the recovery efforts associated with that, but as part of that exercise, we as a leadership team, and we haven't had a board meeting yet to discuss this, but I'm sure we will, right, Anna? Uh, is what did we learn from that process? Were we really ready? Um, what could we have done differently? What will we do differently? Okay. Um, and I will not ask you specifically what you will do differently, but I think you make a great point that we have to use those situations as studies and really learn from them or there's a tragedy, not learning from something like that. Yeah, and I don't mind sharing a few things. Um, from the learning. First and foremost, um, it's quite evident to all of us on the leadership team that, you know, we think about our plant and our facility and our ability to serve our customers. But um, you really have to take into account how your employees are impacted in that event. You know, we have over 10% of our employees on site that lost everything. Um, they have families, they have children. They're trying to manage their day to day at a time when we need their ability to be available to recover, you know, for the recovery efforts on our plant. And uh, so we've scrambled, if I could say it that way, with our HR teams and other locations to provide as much relief as we can to our employees personally so that they can dedicate the necessarily time to help us with our recovery efforts on site. And then perhaps even something that might feel obvious to some of you, but um, we had presumed that if you have both Verizon and AT&T sell cellular phones going into the event, one or two should be workable. Not so in this case. We will have satellite phones available uh, for the next storm season because both cellular networks were completely wiped out in this case. If you have seen the pictures of Panama City, mm -hmm. um, I have visited now, we went in about a week after the event and uh, I used to live in Kansas, and I've seen tornado destruction. Just imagine miles and miles of tornado destruction as caused by a hurricane. It is significant. And um, it, uh, it's, uh, it's a miracle, quite frankly, that the uh, fatality count, in my opinion, if you see that, was not higher. Let's move to regulatory changes. It seems that some of the laws or, and rules that are being made are, are very cumbersome now. And we know that there will be more coming down in spite of um, all of us wanting less. So how, are we, how do you deal with the future regulatory changes? Yeah, if I think about regulatory, I actually expand it. And, and I think about the legislative angle because it can come both ways. But then there's also societal pressure, you know, which can often push the regulatory or the legislative uh, changes that we face. Uh, I think we have to understand the claims and the approaches. I mean, you can tie this back to climate change, and you know, this is climate change is not necessarily a subject that gets that, that's very popular to discuss in Texas, right? I mean, we're all energy related and it's much different if you go to Colorado or Maine or California for sure. But, but, but you can't deny uh, that there's something going on and you can't deny that it's an issue in the minds of people that can have an impact on your business. So, so how do you address that? I mean, no action is, 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 is acceptable. I mean, you just can't do that. So the question is, how do you need to adjust your operations? How do you need to adjust your approach? I think one of the things, particularly for the energy industry, is that you have to engage in greater outreach. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, we have to recognize, and this goes back to climate change, that uh, we're at war with some groups. I mean, there's some groups that would like to stop our companies dead in their tracks. And I think oil and gas exploration is a prime example. There's no question that the industry, uh, generally speaking, can be more responsible than maybe it has in the past. Uh, but energy is a lifeblood to any economic system. Uh, 
So what is it that we need to do differently? I mean, a, an example of a risk is you see people attacking pipeline projects. I mean, pipelines are the safest way to move hydrocarbons. Uh, no one would deny that. But the whole idea is to block power lines, block uh, pipelines in order to stop the activity that will use those. So, you know, no one's going to invest in oil and gas production if they can't move it to market. So what are the things we need to do in terms of engagement, outreach, our project planning? Uh, you know, do we spend more money? If you think about how long things can be held up, it's a pretty easy choice to spend uh, a few more million dollars to do things in a different way to allow some more time in the schedule. So some of those are pretty um, uh, dramatic impacts. How much time do we spend uh, meeting with regulators and with politicians? I think in many cases the tendency has been to do that only if we had to. Um, how about an approach in which you proactively do that uh, to kind of, uh, I'll use an old expression, grease the skids a bit on what you're trying to do? From, from, I might add, uh, from, from our perspective, uh, Sue, you, you talked about these three areas, reputational, regulatory, and of course, uh, um, climate, change. Uh, climate change in general. So from my perspective, the regulatory aspect of disruptive risk truly falls in the category of if you are proactive enough in understanding what might happen, you could spin it and turn it into a very positive development for the company. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, you know, there's examples in our own firm where regulatory requirements have changed for certain, for example, plastics and certain types of applications. That's a, actually worked out positively because we saw that ahead of time and worked on some technology that would allow for substitution in a way in which it satisfied that regulatory change. But if we had our head in the sand, and we do sometimes on other things, trust me, but if we had our head in the sand in that case, we might not have moved quickly enough to offer that substitute material and benefit from that regulatory change. So I think regulatory of those three I think regulatory has the potential, if you, if you can manage it right, you might find a way to work in a positive outcome as opposed to just negative. Excellent. I love this question from the audience. Can you provide examples of long-term disruptive risk that your boards are dealing with and don't include hurricanes? I don't consider a hurricane as a disruptive risk. This is a known risk that should be planned for as part of the business continuity um, management program. Comment? Well, we've certainly talked about one in the form of climate change and uh, what impact that has ultimately on product requirements, product demand, how might you reshape your business around that. Um, that's one that comes to mind. Um, some others I think are pretty obvious if you think about the, whole, the hotel industry, what impact does uh, Airbnb have on yes. it? What, what impact does Uber have if you are prone to use black cars from time to time to go to the, uh, to the airport, you'll find that their business is down considerably. So, uh, you know, what's, what's the solution there? So maybe I'm grasping to straws, but some of those are, are, are pretty uh, significant to those companies. I might add, we, we acquired a business three years ago that was a pine-based chemical business. Um, and um, one of the uh, alternative uses for the material that we use in our chemical business as a feedstock is the biodiesel markets. And uh, we're watching very closely what's happening in Europe with respect to the percent of biodiesel that's required to be in the overall gasoline pool. Um, because, you know, I can't control what the good people at the EU decide to do with respect to renewable fuels, but it could have an impact, obviously, on the alternative value of our feedstocks. So that would be an example of that kind of disruptive risk that I don't really have the ability to predict the ultimate outcome, but we're watching it very closely. And of course, back to what I said a few moments ago, we'll want to turn it into a positive some way because, um, uh, not all outcomes in this case are going to be negative. The, the nature of the question that was asked I think is excellent and, it's, and it says why wouldn't this be part of the business continuity management program? 
one point to really be made here is you've got to do a good job with the enterprise risk management processes before you can even identify the disruptive risk. So I don't think it matters if you call it a disruptive risk or a regular risk. The facts are it's going to impact the company's revenue and profitability or competitive positioning or reputation. And it may be that in your continuity management program, you maybe haven't thought about two or three things hitting at once or it hitting in a certain place as it did with you. So the point to be made is do a good job with that foundational work. Um, Could I ask, uh, sorry, on this enterprise risk management, it's kind mm -hmm. of a hot button for me. And I encourage you all as directors, when you have that review with your management teams, um, try to help them understand the difference between business as usual and enterprise risk. And the way that I say that is because when we go through our, uh, we do it semi-annually to whether or not we have to update our top 10 enterprise risks, oftentimes we're dealing with issues that seem to have a top 10 label, but I call them business as usual. That's our business. That's what we're mm -hmm. paid to do as managers to manage. We want to identify enterprise risks that if we don't spend the time specifically focusing on, something could go wrong. Um, and so as board and directors, I think you should inc try to really challenge your management teams on, are these things that are inside the normal day-to-day -day, or are these truly things that if you don't manage them, it could go really bad for the company? And, uh, and then make sure you understand who therefore is responsible. And back to what Bill said earlier, bring them to the board meeting and get them in front of you to answer that question. And I think that then can set a good framework or, or good background or, or environment for then taking it to the next step when you think about disruptive risk. You know, I, I would add one more angle on uh, these disrupt, dis disruptive or emerging risks. You know, if you think about most businesses, we're, 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 we're working hard to maximize the bottom line. And particularly if you're an older organization, you have a lot of legacy businesses and legacy activities. And so there's invariably cost pressure. And uh, now all of a sudden you have a whole slew of uh, a risk to, uh, to consider. So you know, Kevin now goes back and makes sure that there are satellite phones at every plant that's vulnerable, which makes good sense. But you know, think about all those things that wind up uh, creating cost pressures. So it really also comes back then to how well are you running your business? Are you squeezing costs out? Are you finding ways to do things, be do things better in order to make space for these new things that you have to address? And uh, you know, as somebody who's been involved in, in, in reducing costs forever, uh, it's, it's an endless process, but it's one that I think uh, gathers steam. We had a conversation the other day about cyber, and I asked the question of, well, how much money are we spending around our digital transformation and cyber in this particular case? There hadn't been enough focus on that yet. The work was underway, but it wasn't necessarily viewed as, a, as, a, as a, something that was going to unfold over a number of years and would rank just as high on the capital scale as some of the other projects that we would normally do. Okay. Rumsfeld said we need to look for the unknown unknowns. And we've got two questions here. How do you promote thinking outside the box, um, enabling people to go beyond conventional thinking? How do you think about the black swan risk? How do you get your board thinking about these things? those risks that may be around the corner and are unknown. Ideas on that? I think if you walk into a board meeting and say we're going to have an agenda to talk about what the black swan events that could affect the business, it might be kind of a short agenda item. Mm -hmm. um, I think the better way to do it would be for the board to make it very clear to management that we want to have that discussion at the next board meeting or at the spring board meeting. We want you to come with a very robust kind of, the, that straw man I gave, example of the things that, that uh, could be in that category of unknown unknown black swan events. And uh, 
management can do that. Mm -hmm. They will. Um, and the board just needs to make it uh, a priority for them that that's something that they expect uh, management to put the requisite time in. And then the board discussion, I think, can be very, very strong. Yeah, one of the more novel approaches to strategy develop I saw in a company was to ask the board to provide its thoughts to, on strategy to management prior to our annual strategy discussion. Uh, you know, was management trying to figure out what we were interested in or were they really, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of a defensive measure or were they really trying to take it in objectively? But I, I think you could use that process and ask people to think about risks. I mean, the board is an incredibly powerful tool. Uh, I mean, if you construct your board well, you have diversity. And I don't just mean gender and race, and I'm talking about experiences. Mm -hmm. And uh, most directors are on more than one board. So, you know, there's just a, a tremendous amount of, uh, of, of knowledge. And if you can harness that and start talking about some what ifs or things to consider, and it's brainstorming. Not everything is going to be good, but there's power in the process. And if you get two out of 20, I mean, is that, is that bad, particularly if it's, uh, if it's something very significant? But I, I agree with you, Kevin, that rather than just starting that issue cold, give people an opportunity to sit quietly and think about it and come prepared or sit, su su submit something in advance. And I think a good question to ask is, what are five things that would put this company out of business? What could happen that would put us out of business? Now, if you were a taxi cab driver in New York City and you owned a medallion that was valued at about a million dollars, mm -hmm. would you be concerned about all those Uber cars, mm -hmm. Lyft? Um, we've had some tragic things happen in New York City because of that. Um, eight suicides, I believe, um, from taxi drivers. So this stuff is really serious. Um, what could put the company out of business tomorrow? Blockbuster may have asked that, but the outcome was not good. Um, so I, I think if you can get your boards to brainstorm things, that there's not a recipe for all of this. Um, they're not black and white answers. It's talking about things that are really uncomfortable. And I take you back to the board culture. You've got to have the board, diversi board diversity for sure, but you've got to be willing to ask those hard questions. What would put us out of business? And today, I think a answer to that is reputation. We've seen um, businesses destroyed because of the Me Too movement. Um, we've seen leaders taken out because of the Me Too um, movement. Are we asking questions related to that in the boardroom? So ask your companies, your management, what would take us out? Um, how should the board understand the ability of the company to withstand disruptive risk? Um, maybe some stress manage, uh, some stress test. Any comments on that? No, I think stress tests, uh, you know, scenario planning, I mean, just thinking through what the implications are allow you to, to get a better handle and decide what sort of uh, priority you want to put on it. Yeah, if you've ever been involved in any game theory exercises, they can be very helpful, I think, in this context um, because it really causes you to kind of try to find a way to bracket the potential outcomes and then uh, understand what each one of those might be worth. You know, one other point, if I could add, Sue, the, 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 the Blue Ribbon Commission report has some, some, some great tools at the back as well as discussion on the front end, but one of the points that I thought was particularly powerful is if you go through and rate your risks, you know, we tend to sort of list them and we think about them individually. But one of the things that was put forth is to look at the connections between them. And if you have two or three or four things that coalesce together, they might well overwhelm that one big thing that you would otherwise focus on. Uh, so, you know, we worry a lot about our organizational capability. Do we have people to replace aging baby boomers? What's the culture like? What's the morale like? Some of those things can be absolutely uh, 
deadly to you if you're trying to move the company in a, in a certain direction if they're not addressed. So that's, that's, that's a big takeaway for me uh, from the report. Um, let's talk a little bit about people and management. We did that last night at dinner, mm -hmm. um, specifically talking about the millennials coming in and the impact that that's having on business. So can you comment on how um, the ability to retain employees, the ability to attract the right kinds of employees, the shortage of workers we have in certain areas, for example, truck drivers, um, Hat, can you comment on that relative to disruptive risk in the business? Well, I've always lived by the principle that sometimes your strengths become your weaknesses as well. And uh, when you think about companies that have been around a while, they've done such a wonderful job typically working on productivity, doing more with less, um, that they find themselves after a certain amount of time realizing they have a demographic problem. So then, if you have a demographic problem where you could lose a lot of your knowledge base because of just typical retirement happening, um, then you have to look at therefore replacing that knowledge and then you look at today's workforce uh, and the millennials that were mentioned and they come at uh, their career much differently than the current mm -hmm. generations. Uh, so we're trying as a company to figure out how we do that best through college recruiting, through development programs, through flexible schedules. Uh, but you better be adaptive to what today's workforce generation are looking for. And it's not easy. We talked about it last night at dinner, some very colorful examples of how things have changed. Uh, but as a board member again, or as you as directors, you ought to be challenging your executive teams. Are they thinking through how this next generation expects to be rewarded and how they expect to spend potentially not a long time with you in their own careers and adapt accordingly. I would put a pitch in for us uh, older workers. Uh, you know, many of us are leaving, but the reality is 60 is the new 40 maybe. But uh, I think many of us would like to stay engaged. You know, is it something we might do on a part-time basis? Is there something we might do on an advisory basis? So I think we need to be smarter about thinking about this transition I mean, in the oil and gas industry, there was a long period of time where we just didn't bring a lot of new talent in. So then you have this gap in the organization. Mm -hmm. You have to bring the new people along, but you know, it, you, you, you want the knowledge and the experience. And uh, so maybe you put them in position, you do put them in positions of uh, significant authority, but you have somebody there with them. That's a, that's a resource. So. So let's talk about the um, importance of board background and makeup um, and how that's relative to recognizing the risk. And I would ask a couple of questions here. Um, Kevin, you've, you should be commended for this. I think 40% of your board is women now. Um, thank you for doing that. Um, Diver diversity is clearly important. We talked about millennials. Do you need a millennial on your boards? It's funny you say that because after dinner last night, I went home thinking that very <laughs> thing. Yeah. Um, and the reason I said it that way is because uh, for those of you that get the opportunity to spend time with your shareholders, there are a lot of millennials in that shareholder base that are making those decisions on buying and selling your stock. Um, and. Uh, I'm not sure I'm ready yet to introduce a millennial to the Craton board. I'll have to talk to my chairman about that. Uh, but in the context of our diversification, uh, or excuse me, our diversity, uh, I would say that uh, that was not what was the primary driver of, the, of how we ended up having 40% of our board uh, female. We uh, were fortunate to attract very talented directors who wanted to come work for a company that I hope presented a career challenge for them in a way in which it's turned out to be terrific and that diversity is uh, paid for itself several times over and what we do like most boards I'm sure is look at the makeup of your board what their backgrounds are technology financial marketing R&D what do you need and then go out and recruit from various sources and uh, for us it turned out that that talent was uh, available to us and they just happen to be female. 
I mean, I, I, I think that sort of skill-based assessment or building of a board is absolutely imperative. If I think of the Delta Board, uh, we're blessed to have uh, marketing, including digital marketing expertise uh, in a person who happens to be a woman. Uh, we have a cybersecurity expert, uh, having run or been chairman of FireEye, um, that kind of thing. Uh, I bring an energy uh, perspective to the, uh, to the table. Uh, we have a, a retired Secretary of Defense as we think about the security and, and even regulatory or governmental issues. We have a, a prior regulator of the FFA. Uh, and then just great general business people, CFOs and others. So, so that, that diversity is, a, um, is, a, is an imperative. And we actually spend a lot of time in the governance committee um, um, screening, planning well in advance for people that we would like to talk with. Um, so build that diverse board. And great answer. And another thing I would say is I think it's important to look at the personality. Some of us are naturally pessimist, which can be good for talking about risk, but some of us are naturally optimist, and that can be mm -hmm. good talking about risk as well to seek out the opportunities. We're now out of time. You've been a great audience. You've asked great questions. May I ask each of you, do you have a summary comment you'd like to um, end up with? Well, I think my, my closing comment would be that addressing risk, not just the known risk, but the unknown and emerging risk is a core responsibility of ours as directors. And I think that's one of the things we can really help management do make sure the process is in place, but bring our eyes, our knowledge, our experience to the, to the table. And, and I think I'll just stop there. I learned a long time ago from, I, I used to work at Coke Industries, some of you might know that, and, and regardless of what you think politically, Mr. Coke is a brilliant businessman. And he used to challenge us all the time, and he used to say, look, as you get more and more responsibility, your job is not to manage the area under the curve and the normal distribution outcomes. Your job is to manage the tails. Mm -hmm. You know, minimize your exposure on the downside, maximize our exposure on the upside. And so I think a board needs to think about that as well from time to time, particularly when it comes to risk management. Uh, oftentimes I think the board focuses a little bit too often in the big area under the curve. And uh, they ought to do that by choosing the right leadership team, hiring and firing them, <laughs> and then focus on those tails. Mm -hmm. And I would say in summary, please read this BRC. I hope you will find it rich with information that will help you. And we don't know what the unknowns, the unknown unknowns are, and we'll never find out unless we ask questions, dive deep, and understand um, all of the things that we've talked about today and in the BRC. So thank you very much. And um, again, it's a pleasure to be here and we wish you the best in, in this endeavor. Thank you. Well